Hey, hey, hey. I'm Michelle. And I'm Greta. We are girlfriends who have always been seekers. We love learning, sharing, and most of all, we love having those soul-to-soul moments with our girlfriends. Our podcast is about spiritual connection and sisterhood. You are not alone. So grab your glass, get comfy, and join us as we make some noise, light up the room, and get get into it. it. The day that we are actually releasing this podcast is a very significant day for Michelle and her family. It will be 10 years that her baby brother, Joey, passed. And I am just so beyond proud of you that you wanted to come on this podcast and talk about your brother and loss and grief. And I just think you're so brave. For doing this, this is not an easy day. I'm really proud of you. You're amazing. Thank you. So I have a few gifts sitting in front of me that were very significant. Um, One of them is a watch that my brother gave to me on Mother's Day, actually, which was the last holiday we had him for before he died. And it's interesting because I... I look at it and I'm reminded that it's been 10 years. It is a very significant date and a very significant time frame in my healing journey. And so I wanted to really start off by reading a journal entry because I think it just sums up a lot of what I want to say and will just kind of help to get things started. It's always a difficult thing to figure out where do I want to start in this story. Mm -hmm. And it'll probably take us back, I'm sure, to where you were when you wrote this and all the raw feelings you were feeling at the time. Yes. And where I am now in my healing journey is amazing. 10 years sometimes feels like it's been a long time. And sometimes it feels like it was just the other day. So this is a journal entry from May 22nd. 2019. So it was exactly six years ago on a Wednesday morning when my brother was killed in a work accident. As I reflect on that day, it seems a bit surreal that I am living in the shadows of his memory in this very town. I've met many people who heard about what happened. I've experienced many moments that trigger what those first days were like as we tried to piece together the story of his death. I drive the streets he drove a few days a week wondering if it is a coincidence that my current place of work is on his very route, passing by businesses who were all somehow involved in what happened. I can only believe that the sound of forklifts moving about in the parking lot next to the spa where I provide healing treatments to others are to actually help me with my own healing. I am, however, offered many moments of silence to meditate and allow thoughts to pass just as we all will one day. There are days when I become flooded with emotions of sadness, still wondering and asking why and how. I mostly wonder what he was thinking the very moment before the cement wall struck him down, knocking the life out of him. I often wonder if he stared out at the valley below just before his soul left his body. Did he notice how amazing the rays of the sun looked as they covered the mountaintops? You may not know this, but... There are moments when a simple word like wall or brother can make my throat swell and my eyes well up as I stand before you engaging in casual conversation. But you should also know that I've gotten really good at handling that now, that grief thing. But every once in a while on a day like today or a week like this week, grief becomes my kryptonite and I get tired and a moment of post-traumatic stress brings me to my knees. And then I rise up and I go about my day. I do feel stronger as each year passes. And I share these words to let you know that when your time comes to grieve those you have loved, that I will understand. And that my experience allows me to connect with you through yours. And that it does take time, but the pain is real. The heart will let you know when it is time to stop and feel and sit in this space and allow yourself to grieve. Our bodies have an innate wisdom, and I've learned to listen closely to mine, rest when I need to rest, or surround myself by others when I need that kind of support. Today will be a busy one. I wasn't able to do that two years ago. It amazes me to think about where I was then and where I am now. 
I miss my brother. Today I will honor his memory and I will share these words to do just that. He is gone, but not forgotten. And here we are, 10 years. 10 years. 10 years, and I get to share my journey, my experience, who he was with a large group of people. Yes, and as you were reading that, I just kept thinking your words will heal and help a lot of people that are feeling the same way, are in different aspects of their healing journey with loss and grief. And so I just really thank you so much for having the bravery to share that with everyone. (sighs) Thank you. You know, there's moments where I feel like I can talk about this and be very open about it and no emotions will set in. And then there are moments where you have these conversations and all of a sudden you just can't get a word out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So thank you also for allowing me to do this and take up space on our platform and the things that we're doing together so that I can be very raw and hopefully connect with others who understand and feel this level of grief. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing about grief is it 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 doesn't ever go away. It it's it just looks differently throughout the process and shows up differently. And even when you were saying like like a cement wall will be a triggering word for you, I've talked to other people who have that same experience where there's just the smallest thing can put you right back there and. It's just such a process that doesn't just move forward in a linear way. It goes back and forth. It is. And I think sometimes when you're in it, you're not even sure what you need. Mm. And I remember before this incident happened, I have been around death since a young girl. I had lost a lot of people in my family and then through high school, people that I knew who had passed. But this was probably the first one that that changed just so much. And so when I would be around other people who were grieving in the past, I didn't really understand and I didn't know how to reach out to them. And and when you ask a question like, what do you need? And they're just kind of staring at you. I understand now that sometimes you don't. And I think my biggest thing when I was on this uh, grieving path was, where do I even start? What resources do I have? Some people just need one person to talk to and that works for them. I felt like I needed to dive into the meaning of life. Mm -hmm. And I was very consumed by what is our purpose? Why are we here? Mm -hmm. If, you know, somebody's life can be taken at 34, six years old, a baby, like Mm -hmm. what is the purpose as to why we're even put here to begin with? So that is really what got me researching and talking to others who had lost and, Mm -hmm. and gathering information and trying to understand Once I get to a place of good healing, how can I then be present and what can I provide to others who are also going through some kind of deep grief in their life as well? I imagine in the beginning, you probably were just frozen, though. Do you think you went right into that or is that part of your journey later on? So thank you for asking that because I do want to share a little bit about how things happened. People may have heard my journal entry and they're wondering like, what do you mean cement wall? What happened? So just to give a very quick summary, my brother was a truck driver and his job was basically to get an assignment and go from point A to point B, hauling whatever material he needed to. And this particular day, his assignment was to move these 7,000 pound cement walls from point A to point B. And when he got to point B, what he didn't know was that there was already some rigging that happened to get the walls onto his trailer. And he's not part of any of that. He's just the driver. So when he got to point B, the person who went to move the walls off of the truck, I won't get into details here because there's some legality issues and things like that. But essentially, when somebody went to move a 7,000 pound wall off of his truck. It struck him and he died instantly. And so when we got the news, unfortunately, my mom was at home and police came and it was that whole kind of situation. I was just getting off of work. My dad came to tell me after he had spoken to the police officers And we were all very confused because in the beginning, like you mentioned, sort of this shock 
thing. It's like, wait, what happened? And you're just trying to figure out how is this even possible? Your mind is not even comprehending it yeah. yet. And I think because, you know, we didn't get to see him right away. It wasn't until his funeral and it was only for a very short period of time during a viewing. But again, in your mind, you're just not connecting that this is real. So the journey for us in the beginning was even trying to figure out this mystery of how did this accident happen? And is it really real? Yeah. Like, is he going to come walking through the door? And we're just all, you know, we didn't see him gone. Mm -hmm. So we're just getting information from people and your brain is trying to create a story and yes. nothing was making sense. And it was trauma. You're in tra you're in a state of shock and disbelief and yeah. just it's not like death is easy in any capacity but mm -hmm. to have it to have no idea that that day was going to end like that. You probably felt like you were in a dream state. Like it wasn't real life when you got the news and the police are in front of your mom's house. And Yes. I used to explain it. It's surreal. Like you're having mm -hmm. this out-of-body experience. And for me, my brother and I were extremely close. So age-wise, we were just about two and a half years apart. But he was my go-to for everything. I mean, I shared a story with you earlier about like I'd forget my curling iron in the house and he's the person I'd call to say, please go by the house and check if my curling iron is still plugged in or I'm having a baby in the hospital and I need you to stay with my other child or I'm planning a birthday party. Are you spending the night? What's happening? You know, like he was just that person in my life. So this idea that he's not there was like, n no, like that doesn't even make sense to me. You describe him as having this like big personality, full of life, helpful, positive energy. Yeah. Always a good time. He'd surprise you all the time. He'd actually just show up in my house. He had a key and just <laughs> would walk through the door and it's like, hey, what are you doing? You know, and nobody ever felt like he was invading space. It's like the minute Joey walked in, it was going to be a good time. Mm. He was a hugger. He just was there for for so many people. The, the loss that I'm describing and again, it's not to minimize anyone else's relationships and what loss looks like to them. Because one thing I also learned is that our grief is so unique and our relationships with people in our lives is so unique. My grandmother's death was very, very devastating also, but this was different. And so I think also when someone dies young, you know, that's not the order of how things are supposed to go. Like my mom should never be bearing a child no matter what age they yeah, are. Yeah, and I think that's a big point. I think a huge part of grief is that resistance of this is not the way it was supposed to be because, yes, so sad that you lost your grandma. I know you were really close with her, but we know in our minds that that day will come with grandparents. Right. But with your baby brother, you, I'm sure, had already envisioned your life together and – you know, just those those pivotal moments that you expected him to be at. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden he's not. And there's this. But no, it's not supposed to be like this. Mm -mm. Well, and, and at the time I had three small children and he had a five year old daughter. The night before he died, he was supposed to spend the night at my house because my husband was out of town. We were actually in the process of moving to Southern California. And my brother was always the guy that would step in when my husband was gone. So again, it's like, wait, what? No, no. There were plans and talks about him moving with us and all these things that you just think are the natural order of how life is supposed to go. So then when something like this happens, it it scrambles everything that you know to be true. And so after receiving the news and in, in being in front of my mom, which was one of the hardest moments of my life, she looked at me and said, I can do nothing. So I knew that as confusing as things were and as hard as they were, I had to go into action mode. Mm -hmm. And what that looked like was go get his car, go to the morgue, start making phone calls to my other brother, to the, All the things that need to be done that we don't think about when we're have faced with sudden loss. And yes, you know, there's things that have to be taken care of. And when you're grieving somebody, you're not thinking about going to pick up their car and 
mm-hmm. telling their daughter that their father died. I had the role of all those things. So in the very beginning, it was very much this out-of-body experience of planning a funeral, trying to get my husband back home, being with my dad, having very intimate moments where we're both struggling to get the words out because we're just crying and driving all over the place. At one point, we even went to go talk to the property owners of where he died. And it was the son of this woman who killed my brother and having conversations with that mother and trying to hold grace for her and thinking, oh my gosh, my son just killed somebody. And at the same time, there's grief there too. What is his life now going to look like? And there were so many layers of things that were happening at that time. So to go from where do you start? For me, the starting point was I had to just do some administrative work. Yeah. And and that- Because your mom, your mom couldn't. She was in too much pain. No. And that's um, women that have lost children. They say it's a club you never want to be in. Mm-hmm. But it's, they all understand each other. There's this, this deep sadness. There is. And in the beginning, sometimes you want to be around people who have also experienced something similar to you because you feel like nobody else can understand what it is that you're going through right now. And I want anyone listening to this not to think that, you know, if you know somebody who's grieving a certain way to stay away and not connect because you may not share that same experience. It's not that because Also, knowing that the love and support is pouring in is the other thing that keeps people afloat. When my friends just showed up to my house and started washing my dishes, buying food for my kids, handling my household chores, that was so, so, so amazing because I couldn't be present for that. And I had to still run a household, but I was so checked out and so removed from that process that when people stepped in and just handled it, oh my gosh. So the other thing I learned, because I'm going to give a lot of things that I've learned throughout this process, but the other thing I learned is everybody has a different gift. I had friends who just showed up at my mom's house that day, hugging us and crying with us and bringing food there. I had friends that were helping me make arrangements for the funeral and were were helping with those administrative tasks. So the support system is huge. And I think as a supporter, knowing what your gifts are and figuring out how to bring those to the table when you're trying to support somebody else who's Mm -hmm. grieving is a super important thing. I think if you are someone that is trying to support someone that is experiencing loss, Mm -hmm. it's probably a good idea to try to look at their specific situation and try to see where there are holes or spaces, things that need to be filled. Because Mm -hmm. a lot of times everyone just wants to like, here's a casserole. And I've heard you end up with all this food that you're not, you don't even have an appetite. It's good to eat and kind of, you need to be Mm -hmm. taken care of in that way, but it can be a lot of food. Because I'm sure when you're in that space of deep, deep grief, you're not even thinking about if the dishes are done or the laundry is done and you still had little kids that needed to be taken care of, taken to school doctor's appointment. Life doesn't stop. Right. And that's an important point too, because I know for me, as I sat watching everyone else live their life and life is still going on. And even though everything has went in way slow motion and almost to a still point Mm -hmm. in my world, that's not what's happening around me. And, And even that concept of trying to understand how do I stay in the stillness while everything's spinning all around. And and also for me, there were moments where I was scaling everything of importance, where it became, okay, who cares that the house is a mess? I can't. Mm-hmm. Somebody just died. What else? I don't give a fuck about I don't give the a house. Shit. Oh, I'm sorry. You're crying because you were 30 minutes late to an appointment and now you have to reschedule. You have an opportunity to reschedule. It was literally like everything I did. I went to the grocery store. People are complaining in line and I'm like, yeah. you're not fucking grieving right now. Maybe they were. I don't know what someone else is going through, right. but I'm saying there's some things that on the surface in our lives on a day to day because we're so caught up seem like big things. And all I remember standing there thinking and looking at everybody was like, oh my God, did you just lose a brother? Was your brother killed by somebody? I mean, you know, 
to it, put it everything constant. in perspective. Yeah. It's like this is way up here in terms of what yes. matters compared yeah. to the little things that we get so worked up about in life. Yeah. And it was like that for a long time. Sometimes it still is. There are yeah. things that I think about and I'm just like, well, you know what? No one's dying today in my circle. So well, today's it changes a good day. you. Forever. Yeah. You'll never be the Michelle that you were before that day, May 22nd, 10 years ago. No. And also at that time, if I take myself back 10 years ago, finding that joy again was a process. And I remember in the beginning, somebody would make a joke about something and nothing was funny to me. Yeah. Nothing. And I didn't want to go to the parties. I didn't want to go watch a movie just nothing was funny. And this is just my story. I mean, everyone, again, handles grief so differently. So for some people, they might want to just take a trip and and get out of you know the area. And I was also fortunate and unfortunate because right after his funeral, we moved to Southern California. So there was a piece of me that was like, oh my gosh, I am going away to a town where I know nobody. So I don't have my support and I don't have my mom nearby to support her. And that felt very lonely at first, but also it felt a little bit free because I didn't walk into the coffee shop that my brother went to all the time and had somebody ask, oh, where is he today? And yeah. I had to share you know, what had happened. And then, and I, I will definitely say this was God, at the time, I was also really into where I was in my spiritual journey. So I was going to Bible study groups. And as I even asked the questions of, you know, what's the purpose of life? All these amazing people just started getting put into my life. So for me, some of the things that helped me were finding signs, were finding things that made meaning for me. So for example, the, one of the first set of friends that we made, their names were Michelle and Joey, and they lived in apartment number 22, which, you know, I uh, May 22nd. Michelle. So 22 became a very significant number in my life. And like, like, okay, is that a Michelle coincidence? Michelle and Joey? And yeah. The, and they live in 22, apartment 22. It, that's too. Come on. Yeah. So that those types of things were happening all the time. I would set up ADT, for example, security system on the house we were renting. And the person who was setting it up would all of a sudden start asking me questions that were leading to, did somebody die that was close to you? And I'm like, okay, I'm trying to get, you know, an alarm system set up in here. Where are we going with this? And it was also interesting because she would say things to me like, I'm smelling motor oil. Did they die next to a truck? So for me, those were moments of like, okay, whoa, first of all, there's this whole spiritual world that is beyond our day to day. And how do we tap in and stay connected to all those things? Um, but I, I had to really open and expand my mind and be willing to notice things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like that part of all of this is really big because it still happens till this day. As a matter of fact, the watch that my brother gave me on Mother's Day just before he died said love on it. And a friend of mine who also feels like she connects with my brother and she had never met him, she was at a volleyball tournament and on the table, the only necklace that was left was a necklace that had the number 22 on it and said love and same colors like black, black and silver. And silver. <laughs> and I had another friend in Southern California just as a gift, give me a bracelet that was black and silver that said love. And so, you know, again, like that's not a coincidence. Now, do you think your brother was showing up for you to help guide you out of this deep, dark grief? Yeah. Yeah. I do too. Yeah, because there was a while where I didn't want to leave my house. I had also lost a few other people around that time. And so for a minute, I was filled with anxiety, like, who's dying next? And something else that was really helpful for me was to go to therapy. I found a therapist who, again, at that time, I was really into my Christian faith. So it was important for me to find somebody who had the same sort of beliefs as I did so we can speak kind of the same language. And she happened to have lost a sister mm -hmm. as well. So I felt like she felt my pain. We were in it together. So therapy on that level was super important. I also went to a chiropractor because I'm a very somatic person. I feel things in my body and I know that I was 
gripping and mm-hmm. holding and, and then releasing, just like mm-hmm. crying and crying. But you knew things get stored in the body. And yeah. so you needed that. Even release from a chiropractor, that's something I wouldn't have thought of, but that's makes yeah. sense. I felt like for all the systems in my body to function the best because there was lack of sleep, I tried to really focus on water intake and certain foods, but I knew that I needed more. Talk about being on a mindfulness journey. Yeah. Like this grief journey for me was also that. Mm-hmm. So I took a lot of walks. There were times where I would walk and I would just stare off at the mountain. And I had moments where I felt like I was the mountain Mm. and the mountain was me. It was this surreal experience again, where you almost felt like you just morphed into nature and something that, again, was spiritual and bigger than our material. Well, we hear we are all connected to everything, nature, each other. It's such a hard concept to grasp, but that was beautiful the way you just described that. Like you were the mountain, the mountain was you. There is no... There is no separation here. It's like Joey is here. He's, we're all connected. There's this illusion that it's separate Mm -hmm. and that they're gone. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's amazing. And I'm sorry if this triggers anyone, but when you see a body with no soul, you really understand that these shells that we're in are just that. They are these houses. And I always think of this analogy, like when you look at a neighborhood and you see a house that's been abandoned and there's just a feeling of there's no life in here. Mm -hmm. There's no people, there's no activity. And when a soul leaves a body, it looks empty. And so to be that close to death, to understand that who we are on a spiritual level is so much more than who we are in physical form. That's why having a podcast where we get to talk about these things openly and dive into them, it's so meaningful. And this process also allowed me to get so close to so many people because you're in your most raw form. And I, and I always felt like the people that I met during that time, I'm like, whoa, you're seeing me at the worst of my worst. Yeah. There's no putting on a happy face. Like you just can't do it. No. So they got to see the core of you. Yes. Without any kind of facade. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And that's what the grief journey does. It, it moves us into these places. And I also, I did do a few other courses where a couple years later, our church had a course on grief. And, you know, we talked about the stages of grief because that's the other thing. Sometimes people think, oh, I'm sad. And then I just kind of transition back into life. No, things hit at different times. And that's true with any grief or any kind of loss, right? You go through this point where you have different emotions, where it may start as sadness, then it becomes anger. And I remember going through that in the beginning, it was like, oh my gosh, how could this happen? And I was sad for the person on the other end. And then it shifted to like, I'm mad at you. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm fucking mad at you. How could you do that? How could Mm -hmm. you have taken, you took my brother, you. And Mm -hmm. then I had to move to a through a place of forgiveness. And that was also hard. I had to forgive a lot of people. Otherwise, it could eat you alive if you didn't. Yes. So that was really good. You were able to even do that. You know, if I'm remembering my brother, like, yeah, he was a passionate person. Sure, things would set him off like anybody else and get pissed. But who his spirit was on a day-to-day was like, he just wanted to have a good time. Like that, that's what he tried to find the fun and everything. And I just had a little aha moment because one of my words for the year 2023 is fun. My intention for the year was like, how can I bring the fun into all the things I'm doing? That's really cool (laughs) because I just had an aha moment. So if you've listened to some of our previous podcasts, we were meeting with the incredible Nicole LaFranchi and the end of our visit, Uh, Joey came through. There was no intention of doing a reading that day. (laughs) Nicole has some incredible gifts. And Joey made his presence known. And I mean, the the person that the energy that she described was so jovial, positive, excited, like jumping up and down, (laughs) like just full of this enthusiasm for us and for this podcast. Mm -hmm. And I really believe because it's funny, the the number 22 just keeps showing up for me too all the time now. So he's making sure I'm aware he's around too. And I feel like he's our silent partner. Like yeah. he's, <laughs> he's a silent partner of That's My Girl podcast. And, you know, 
he's working from the other side. So Aww. we're so that lucky feels, to have that. That feels so good to hear you say that. It really, it feels, it feels real. It does. <laughs> I mean, it already felt that way before he came through during that surprise reading. But especially after that, I was just like, oh my gosh, he really is encouraging us to do that. Well, and it started in 2022. And the fact that your word is fun for 2023, <laughs> I'm just like, yep, he's, He's just here. He's all around. Yeah. Well, and I, I'm not surprised because I am. So one of the things about my brother is if something happened that was great to you in your life, like, I don't know, you got a promotion or you bought a new car, or whatever the circum, you're going on this fabulous vacation. My brother would act as if he was mm. experiencing those things with you and he would be your biggest supporter. It'd be like, oh, what are you going to do on the vacation? And, you know, tell me all about it. And, oh, I got to try that sometime. And that was his spirit. So what's also interesting, he wasn't around when we bought this home. And one of the first things that I noticed when I walked into this house was a picture of two birds. And that's another one of my signs for him because oh, there's so much to say about this. So I'm trying to keep it short. But the song Free Birds came up about a week before he died. And I was driving around and I thought, wow, this song would be amazing for somebody's funeral. And then other things started coming into my head. And I was actually starting to plan somebody's eulogy. And I didn't know it was him until obviously that day came. Wait, why were you starting to plan? I don't know. Oh, gee. I don't oh, know. wow. It kicked it off with the song Free Birds. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, oh, this would be a really good song if somebody died. And then I started thinking of different songs that would be good. And then I started thinking of words I would say at someone's wow. funeral, but not knowing wow. whose funeral. Well, and you've said this before that you have this ability to kind of, you have a sense that something's going to happen, but you don't know how, or like mm -hmm. you have a little bit of a ping that happens, yes. but it's not a clear picture. Correct. Yeah. I don't have all the pieces. Mm -hmm. I just have these like downloads of information and these feelings. And I was crying in my car, like I'm at the funeral and I had no idea. And this is a week before he passed. And yeah. so the day after he passed away, when we were at my mom's, these two birds also got trapped in her garage. And then they were fucking with everyone. Like <laughs> somebody would go in the garage and it would hit the person in the head or, and yes. So two birds just continued to show up. And so when I walked in this house, there were the two birds. And this podcast room that we're in used to be a guest room. And I always thought, oh my gosh, if my brother were around, this is the space that he would occupy because he spent the night at my house all the time. And every time he was at my house, he's like, I feel like I'm on vacation. I could see him in this space feeling that same way but maybe he created, you know, what we're doing in this conversation that we're yeah. having right now. I think he's had a hand in all of it. I really, really do. I think he's our third silent partner. <laughs> <laughs> he is. He is. He absolutely <laughs> is. So I will say in the journey is finding synchronicity, I think is so important for the healing journey because I do truly believe that spirits speak to us. And if you're open to look out for these things and receive these things, the more they come. I have been in so many situations where it's not even me going to like a psychic person or or seeking out information and people have just kind of brought it in to me. And that that does bring me joy. I think spirit uses people a lot yeah. to send messages to maybe redirect a path or I do believe that too. Yeah. So that brings me comfort to know that I'm not just in this alone and that his existence looks different, takes different shape and form now, but he really still is part of my everyday life. And also in the beginning, my other brother and I would call each other and it's like, okay, are your lights flashing? Is your TV getting all funky right now? And we had a lot of moments like that. Mm -hmm. So she even had one recently. <laughs> we did. Where we were getting ready to prepare our talk about spirituality and the lights in the studio were flickering nonstop while we were reading our little messages from this book ceremony that I brought. And like, just pay attention. Yeah, yeah. Pay attention. And maybe don't talk yourself out of the that being a sign. Just let it be what it is. And if it gives you comfort, let it 
give you comfort. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you still have a lot of moments of sadness and, mm-hmm. and it hits you unexpectedly. But even just since the beginning of the talk, when you were reading what you had written six years ago to where you're at now and, and how you're describing the beautiful messages you've received from him, I see the light and the sparkle in your eyes. And it's like you have this knowing mm-hmm. that he is in your heart. He is around you. And I do think that that we need that to be able to continue on. And And our loved ones want nothing more than to see us fulfill our purpose here. We are a spirit that came here to have a human experience. Mm. And we really sell everyone around us, including ourselves, short if we do not live fully because we're so stuck in grief. Yeah. Yes. And, and at your own time and at your own pace, pictures were a big deal where I couldn't look at a picture of him for several years. I mean, I would get a glimpse of his forehead on a picture and I immediately was brought to tears and it's like, I can't, I can't look at this. But I would talk to cousins of mine or friends and still to this day, people are like, I have his picture right on my dashboard. I have his picture right on my refrigerator. He's had babies named after him. He had a huge impact. He did. And his presence is just all over the place. But it it, it does take time. It actually just reminded me of something that happened recently. You just had a birthday and I surprised you by putting together a little montage of some baby pictures of you for social media. And after I had asked your mom if I could get some baby pictures, I had the thought of, oh my gosh, she's going to have to see pictures of Joey. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way she's not going to be able to do that and not see pictures of Joey. And then I thought how hard that must be. And it's just... It's like you just never know when that grief is going to show up. And I mean, she got me the pictures right away. She's such a strong woman, but I just felt bad that I even asked her that. Well, and, and I'll be honest with you. She did share with me that that was a difficult process. However, she also, you know, being 10 years later, for her, it's it's it looks different. Her grief looks different than mine, right? But but in the beginning, I mean, years. I'm talking like this is only recent that she's even been able to look at a picture. So it's it's interesting time wise too, though that if we would have done this three years in, she may have had to say to you, "No, I, I just can't." Yeah. Or you can come over. Here's mm-hmm. a book. Go ahead, pick what you want. But these little milestones are so interesting and important to pay attention to. And I felt one of the reasons why I wanted to read one of my journal entries, which by the way, I did start a blog shortly after he had passed just because I do feel that uh, for me, writing is very therapeutic. But to also read back on some of these things and go, whoa, I remember what that felt like. Mm. And it feels different now. And so to also be mindful of the progress along the way. Progress. Yeah. And it's been 10 years. That's a decade. A lot Mm. has happened in 10 years. Experienced growth through that. Yeah. This loss Mm. and this, it's a hard way to have to experience personal growth. Mm -hmm. It is. But timeframes are very important. Also in the beginning, a lot of times when people who are supporters, they want you to move through it really fast. Mm. And they're also probably grieving you, right? Mm-hmm. As a person and like, the oh, loss. where did my friend go? Or what did, where yeah. did my brother, where did my daughter, whatever. But everyone has their own times to grieve. And you can't push that. I personally felt like by me getting all these resources that I needed helped me to move through it at the pace that was perfect for me. Mm-hmm. And so for people out there who are experiencing grief, or even if you're in the support role, you know, this is not something that can be rushed. It's it's really a mindful, it's really a very intentional process. I didn't necessarily want to be in this space where it's like, oh, I just want to get through it. But I, I definitely felt like, okay, I'm going to feel this. I'm going to feel this. But I think for me, having kids so little, that was some of my motivation also to be like, I don't want them to see a mom that's sad all the time. Mm-hmm. And it's okay if I cry in front of them. And I did. I allowed myself to feel. And there were days where they come into the bedroom and I'm just in bed and I'm sad, but I got up to take them to school every day. I, I was at every field trip. I still pushed myself as hard as it was to be there. And when someone asked me, are you okay? Honestly, I was like, no, no. <laughs> I'm not. And my brother was just killed and I'm trying to process this. So it's okay if you don't want to be around me right now. And some people can say that's TMI or 
why, you know, why are you sharing all that? But you know what? I had to. The more I talked about him and the more I talked about what happened, I mean, the Trader Joe's people were the best. Like, I talked to somebody at, you know, the register and next thing you know, I got flowers coming to my car Aww. and people are helping me put groceries away and they were so loving and it was amazing. And so don't be afraid of grief. Don't be afraid of somebody who's hurting. Just listen to them. Just hug them. Just leave that candle at their doorstep with a note that says, I'm thinking of you. Send that text. I think taking that inspired action is kind of what you're saying. Sometimes we have these thoughts that arise like, oh, I should call so-and-so today or I should send them a text. And then we have that fear of like, oh, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe it'll upset them. Maybe sending them this will remind them that they've had this traumatic loss. When in reality, there's nothing you can say that's going to like remind me that is something that is present and there all the time, Mm -hmm. sadly. But hearing from the people that love you Mm -hmm. is healing in whatever way, shape or form. Yeah. Yes. It's, It's so important because I think people need to feel supported and loved and also not forcing someone to like, if they don't want to talk, you don't have to, you don't have to fill the space with words. Just knowing that someone is sitting beside you is such a comforting thing. Like I said, coming to somebody's home even, you know, and and you can text them before or whatever. But I mean, being in someone's home, if all of a sudden that person goes quiet, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not enjoying your presence. It's just that their grief is so heavy and it's taking over. And so even offering to them, like, do you need to go nap? I can do your dishes while you nap or I'll leave. But silence, I think we're so uncomfortable with it. And during times of grief, there will be silence. Expect that to happen. That's an interesting concept that I wouldn't have thought of. And it is like you're your everything you're trying to heal your physical and your spiritual and your emotional is all trying to grapple with what happened and yeah. heal and so silence can be so therapeutic and healing and just what your mm-hmm. what your body and your mind need that yeah way. i mean we were talking a little bit earlier today about just like the body being in homeostasis and constantly wanting to get into this place of balance that's how we're designed you know you have a cut all these things come to action. The Mm -hmm. cells start to come up and everything starts to happen to heal that wound. And so we have to honor that in our bodies too and know that it's okay to just be. I love that you just brought it from a physical to a a mental, emotional form of healing because that's that's exactly what it is. We talk so much about how the body heals itself in physical form, but I think oftentimes we forget the healing that really needs Mm -hmm. to take place especially in grief, yeah, emotionally yeah. and mentally. And I see all these things as one, the mind, body, yes. spirit connection. And that's another point I want to make. So it's interesting in reflecting on life because when I had my children, especially my, well, my first child, I quit my job in the legal environment and I moved into this place of wellness. And at the time, I didn't realize that I was really collecting tools along the way. And so when all of this happened, there was a legal aspect that happened. There was just needing to breathe, like where's my breath? I don't, I don't know. You know, it's like it's being held. And so moving into the space of, no, I need to feel myself breathe. Just that act alone was like, I'm alive. I'm alive. Breath is life. And like, let me have this in my body. And then the tools of yoga, movement, and knowing how important, you know, that is. And then I did massage therapy. And so allowing myself to be touched and vulnerable. um, Stuck energy needs to get moved out. Yes. And I remember shortly after my brother died, when I we moved to Southern California, my mom came to visit. And Eddie, my husband, sent us to get massages. And you know, I, I told my mom, like, it's okay if you just sit on the table and cry the whole time. That is okay. We need to release. Get it out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because I think, oh, in thinking about stuck emotion, grief has got to be one of the most detrimental to yes. your physical being. Mm-hmm. Because yep. it's heavy. Yeah. Very heavy emotion. 
It is. And there are some people, and again, everyone has their journeys, but some people take medication to help Mm -hmm. them. You know, I know both my mom and I were offered different medications and we just tend to be people that try all natural holistic things first. That's just who we are. Mm -hmm. However, we did have conversations where it's like, okay, if so much time goes on and we might need to reevaluate what's available. And so I think all those things are super important to just try to connect with when you're going through any kind of a loss is what is it that I need right now? Yes. You specifically, because yes, maybe medication is what you need and that might just be the thing that helps you to move Mm -hmm. out of the stuck part. Yes. And that's okay. Yes, absolutely. So my big message here, number one, my brother was awesome. I'm glad you got to meet him on a spiritual level. (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) And for those who are listening who knew him, I know that this will touch you in different ways because you just know what a presence he had. And sometimes he was the silent guy too. There were times where he just roll up and just be quiet and just maybe stand behind you. (laughs) Everyone's chatting and he's just intently listening. And so he just was this amazing soul and still is. So I feel honored and blessed that I can share him with anyone who's hearing this. But also the the big part of this too is that I guess, thank you, Joey, for teaching me all the ways to get through grief. You know, I mean, that's, it makes me emotional, but it's okay. I can cry and talk about this and I can thank him for giving me the tools and these gifts that now I can use and bring to others. Yes. And that's exactly what you're doing today. And I'm so very proud of you because I know this was not easy, but you are going to help so many people that are on this grief journey. And the work that you did will be a gift to them, hopefully to get them to move forward if they're stuck. Mm-hmm. So, And no, again, you're not alone. No, you're not alone. I'm so proud of Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. If you liked what you heard and were your girls, please share and add a review on iTunes so we can continue to grow our circle. You can also find us on Instagram and TikTok at That's My Girl Podcast.